From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 32, recorded on June 4th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hello, how are you? It's getting warm here. How about there? Yeah, it's pretty warm here. We had a couple of really hot days, and then it got really, really cold and rainy. But yeah. we're back to about 80-something today. It's beautiful. Not so sunny, but nice and warm. I was sitting out on the deck doing some work, so it's nice to be able to work from home and sit outside. Also joining us from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hey there. Good to be here. Good to be back with you all. Yeah, nice weather here. It's humid. I mean, it's North Carolina, so it's to be expected. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, things are going back to trying to go back to normal in the sense of um, non-essential personnel are, are allowed to come back into lab with staggered schedules. So it's it's been interesting. A lot of scheduling. It's all clear. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. My so we we had to go through multiple layers of approvals, but uh, we're we're activated at thirty percent. But since my lab is small, we're at one hundred percent. Oh, good for you. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be back. Um, it's pretty warm here, eighty five. Although it's been storming on and off this week, and I think it's supposed to storm again later this afternoon. Yeah, I heard that yesterday. It got dark. I'm in my basement here. And- <laughs> <laughs> One little window looking on the world, and I looked up, and it was dark. So I said, well, something's going on there. But uh, we are – what are we doing? I'm going in twice a week now. We can ramp up now. We're not at 100%, but you know, we can start – we had to have a ramp-up plan. And I, and I said – and I'm, as usual, I was always the last faculty to do something because I don't really <laughs> care about any of that. <laughs> um, there's one thing, two things I care, three things I care about. The lab – my teaching in the podcasting in the department. Well, I don't mind my colleagues, but I don't like to do ramp up plans. Come on. I'd never <laughs> ramp down. I have one person in my lab and she's been there 724. And what's the difference? Right. And so she wrote, just write, you're coming in two days a week. So I was, okay. <laughs> okay. That's our ramp up plan. But, yeah. um, what a, so, so Cindy, you said you're at 30%, but your lab is, is 100, right? But yeah, other labs, so, they can't be at full, right? Right, right. So my lab is 750 square feet. And if you have less than seven people, you can have up to two people in 750 square <laughs> feet. So okay. so for us, it's it's totally fine. But there's a lot of other labs who have to develop very complicated schedules where they have mm-hmm. like two 12-hour shifts and they're switching at like one o'clock in the afternoon so that it's not a ridiculous, you know, hour for each, you know, set of students or postdocs, but then they're coordinating. But then there are people who share space. So when they have those open labs, it gets way more complicated because, mm, yeah. you know, they're, they're having these, oh, they're telling us to put tape on the floor oh, for man. directional, you know, walking in certain directions around the mm. hallways. And so it's. Do you have to wear a face mask in the lab? They are, so if you are by yourself, you do not. If there is someone else in the room, you do. Hmm. Uh, But I think that some of the students are becoming what they're calling an infection unit. And so if they work together, they're not wearing masks as long as they're only working with each other and no other people. A buddy system. Yeah. (laughs) We've been doing a lot of cool things. Like, so we've been doing some surveillance because they're trying to develop on uh, both a saliva test and an antibody test for widespread use across the campus when we start to bring people back in larger numbers. And so I went and donated some, some spit and some blood. (laughs) Nice. Since I should be negative, my husband was negative. He went and got tested. So are you opening in the fall for class? Do you know yet? We do not know yet. <clears throat> I don't, I, it's, it, it's unclear to me that if people put plans in place that require physical distancing, I don't know how it can happen because we, I, I don't know how we have the classroom capacity to do this. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's Basically, one of our problems. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. True. Basically <clears throat> any class above about 50, it, it, I, I don't see how it's even practical because we don't have the classroom space to do that. Thus, for the smaller classes, they seem to think they could probably arrange it, but there's there is like in cons, 
constant discussion and argument and, and uh, polling and whatever about, you know, the students want an in-person experience. The faculty are like, how can we do that? We don't trust the students to stay away from each other out of class. And then, you know, and then there's, there's, uh, you know, do we bring them back early where there's not enough time to prepare for that? Do we bring them back late, but then send them home at Thanksgiving or do we end at Thanksgiving or, you know, I mean, there's like Mm. a thousand different scenarios that are being thrown around and I'm just, I'm waiting for instruction basically, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I'm, I'm, I have two courses in the fall, one undergrad class that we typically have between 80 and a hundred students. And we're just like, Yep, we're online. Yeah. So we kind of already made that decision already because wow. we don't see a practical way to do it. Yeah, there's been uh, a lot of discussion of the plans here at Drew and the ways that we're trying to make all of that work. Yeah. Well, tell me, I'm, I'm always curious. I have this feeling at Columbia, no virologist or public health person or epidemiologist is involved in the discussion. I think it's mostly lawyers, just about, it's all about liability. Well, I what think you it's guys- a lot about the app. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is there any at your places? Is there any scientific yes, contribution? I, I mean, they have they have we have coronavirologists that are on these committees. Oh, good, <laughs> we have, good. Okay. We have they you know people in the the masters in public health program that's relatively new on Cornell's campus over the last couple of years, and they're involved in this. And yeah, and and you know our provost is actually you know a, a medical type of researcher you know his, it's, it's not exactly this kind of infection biology but he has a, has a knowledge of it mm. and so uh, you know there's there's reasonable input there there they ask so for example they sent out a poll to all the faculty and said you know do do you if you had your choice would you want to be in person or not and so they, they got a feel for the pulse of the faculty because we have a, an older faculty here. You know, we're, we're yeah. top heavy in age. And so a lot of these individuals may be concerned, right. you know, that, you know, they're going to be going in front of a classroom of a, a number of students who, you know, at that, that age in college, you think you're indestructible, right? <laughs> um, and they're, they yeah. are, they yeah. do risky things. They come back here to campus because they want to be with each other, right? Not necessarily to learn because they could learn online. So it's really about the experience of being on campus and, you know, hanging out with your friends and going to parties and whatever. Right. Yeah. I mean, a big part of what we talk about is our small class sizes and our close interactions between students and faculty. Um, And so that is something that is something we want to do in person. Um, I am the microbiology, virology, and immunology um, at Drew. <laughs> wow. So you should be on all the committees. Um, so I am on many emails. Um, and uh, from time to time, some of the um, administrators will ask me specifics about, usually they'll come to me with a plan and say, is this plan crazy? Or we have this plan and we think that this part of it's a problem. And is that correct? And usually I say, yes, that is correct. Um so I've heard uh, a number of the things that uh, people have been thinking about, and many of them are a challenge. I'm not going to say that I think all of the plans are perfect, but um, they are taking a lot of um, important pieces into account. Well, that's good. I mean, I'm glad they're engaging with you, you know? Yeah. Um, it was it was sort of funny. We So our labs are basically us and undergraduate students. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are not allowed to have undergraduate students, um, on campus this summer. Um, but they did open the labs, um, for us last week. So I am now in the lab by myself. I was going to (laughs) say, it's just you. (laughs) It's me. (laughs) Oh no. Um, so every morning I go. Yeah. We don't have our undergrads either. Uh, Steph, you said you guys are pretty much up and running. Yeah. What, so what we, we had to do similar, we had to submit, a plan and a schedule. And we have about 25 people in our lab. So it, it required quite a bit of uh, strategic placement of people. So we're either you, like, for instance, this week, I'm Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, or, or we're Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And you can take as much time in the lab as you want, but you have to update the team's calendar and make sure that, you know, it, because they do not want us more than two people per TC room. They want us six feet apart and we have to wear masks and self-check when we come in. So it's, it's been going fine. I mean, it just, it takes a lot of communication and uh, to make sure that that can happen. <laughs> Are you allowed to trade off shifts? 
We are. At first, we were not. And we're like, we don't know how, you know, research experiments change by the day sometimes. So, exactly. but now they allow it that we can switch now. So, I was going to say, Vincent and I were before the mm-hmm. show, we're talking about, you know, it is nice to get back to a sense of normalcy. But at the same time, you know, COVID is still going on. But, uh, you know, how it would be nice to have an episode where we don't talk about COVID. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I, I put a link in the notes to a Times opinion that came out June 1st, which is an example of this, how colleges can keep the coronavirus off campus. Schools must build cultures of physical distancing. Are you serious? Crazy. It's not going to happen. So this is by the president of Hamilton College and a Cornell professor, Glenn Altshuler. Yeah, yeah. Okay? <laughs> Who, n- neither of whom have any knowledge of viruses. No, no, and no. so, for example, the first paragraph, such tiny lit knit campus communities are tailor-made for spreading an easily transmissible illness like the coronavirus. Really? The coronavirus is an illness, is it? <laughs> and so that just should tell you immediately that these about. people don't know what they're talking about and they haven't consulted a scientist or a public health official. And so I wrote in the in the comments, I said, good luck if you don't have a virologist or a public health person on your committee. And in fact, I wrote the the Columbia provost months ago. And I said, if you want to go back to school in the fall, these are the things you need to think about. And if you don't have people on the committee that are thinking about this and you just have lawyers, forget it. And of course, I never heard back. (laughs) And the excuse is I'm too busy. And that's just BS. I'm sorry. You're just not interested. (laughs) But uh, this has been the case with this outbreak. People who don't know anything are opening their mouths when they when they shouldn't be. That is so. true. So, so what would you what would you have said uh, would be the critical things that would need to be in place if you were polled? Oh, for opening uh, yeah, campus for in the us, fall. For opening campus. Well, I think uh, you have to do face mask. Everybody has to wear a face mask all the time. Yeah. No exceptions. You have to space people out in classrooms uh, because that's a major time of transmission. And if you don't have big enough classrooms, you're going to have to split. You're going to have to have whatever fraction on Zoom and, and the other in class and alternate them, right? That's yep. the fair way to do it. Yeah, no, that's yep. exactly what we're doing is that you – That's part of the plan. Mm-hmm. And you have, to yeah. do, you have to do weekly PCR on everybody. Yep. You have to do daily fever checks. Yep. You can't have massive gatherings. You can't have parties and all that stuff. And you have to have people to police this. That's the hard part. Yep. But it's important. Otherwise, you're going to have outbreaks, especially in the fall as the temperatures are dropping, right? So. Yep. But we're not consulted, and that's fine. I have enough to yeah. do, which is more I, fun. I think that, you know, they, they're talking about limiting activities on, you know, on campus and in dorms and so forth. And I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, eating, do- you know, the cafeterias are a problem, right? So they're talking about grab-and-go yeah, sure. stuff. I would, you know, I agree with that. But the, it's the off-campus that's a problem, right? So once they're out of the first or second year around here, they go and get their own apartments and live with their friends, and then they just have these massive parties in their front yards. And technically, you know, you you could come down on them for that and they could go around and police them. But, you know, it it's hard to police those things. Right. Mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah. And they like yeah. to be in very, very, very close contact sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> they have well, to take their masks off for certain. Well, some, <laughs> so. some, some colleges are. Uh, so I get emails, by the way, all the time about can can you have sex during COVID? Can can you even <laughs> very specific kinds of sex? These reporters oh, are asking so me, like, funny. oh my gosh! I know. Well, didn't they find it in sperm too? But I don't know. Did they? I well, I think RNA. Probably, yeah. probably RNA. But anyway, um, some colleges are not having in person classes in the fall. They've already decided, right? So yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I, mean, I, think I think a lot of them are trying to adjust their calendar to anticipate a spike um, or reduce the need for students to go home and come back. Like yeah, I think that's a big thing is reducing the need for students to leave and come back. Apparently, we're going to have a trimester in the fall. Huh. I don't know. They told us the- that wasn't a possibility because it would require too much rejiggering of the system for like all of the registration, the registrar organization, teachers and organizing their classes and so forth. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. It's well, it'll be interesting. As we go through the summer, we can update people 
yeah. on our on the campus progress <laughs> as we learn more mm. or lack thereof maybe i f- yeah. feel like it changes every other day so yeah ask tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, what we have for today, we we had a section of stuff we just never got to. We have a ton of email. And then we have kind of like these hot topics of things that have popped up since we've last podcasted. So what we could do is we could kind of roll through those hot topics. Some of us are going to be more versed on it than others. So we can kind of bit back and forth. Um, and then try to catch up. And, you know, if we need a part five, we can do a part five. It might be nice to have a non-COVID thing in July. So, but we'll have to see how far we get. Yeah. Um, so for the hot topics, I kind of divided it, of course, the arms of the immune system, innate and adaptive. Uh, f- for innate immunity, really what I've been seeing pop up is people try it because we're really, it's only been a month since, since we last discussed. So we're not going to be learning like deep meaty mechanisms of this virus, but we can look at populations of people who've been infected and try to predict um, severity based on certain markers. Some may call those biomarkers. We've been talking about cytokines like per IL-6, um, I think IL-8, TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta. These are all those pro-inflammatory cytokines that are secreted from um, Cindy's favorite macrophages, but also infected epithelial cells to kind of send out uh, signals that they're infected and they need recruitment of cells. And it, it has contributed to maybe an imbalance in the immune response where you have an over over infiltration of macrophages and potentially also neutrophils. And so there's a paper, well, it's a preprint, but it was out of Mount Sinai and they followed like 1500 patients in a month. And they were able to show IL-6 and TNF-alpha were um, predictors of severity and death, which we could have predicted, but it's nice to see, you know, things come out with it with a, a large sample size that they did. And it's nice to see kind of a bigger picture profiling. I think some of the IL-6 data had been a little anecdotal before. So it mm-hmm. is nice to have this um, as backup. Right. What right. what you don't see, though, is IL-1. Yes. Right. Yes. So I thought that was kind of interesting, especially given one of the other um, papers that you put up there about inflammasomes and pyroptosis, because that's a key cytokine that's released using the inflammasome. And so by not seeing a lot of IL-1, it may be, maybe the inflammasome is not so important. Yeah, I, I have put that in there because I that that inflammasome and pyroptosis, which we can dive into, but that had come out today in Journal of Immunology as, as kind of a commentary on what role they play and if you could block the inflammasome, which is kind of this um, unit of molecules um, that help activate caspases and they can then uh, promote more cytokines uh, production. But IO-1 beta is a really key cytokine, but you're right, they didn't really detect it. Um, and so inhibiting IO-1 beta, which is what is suggested, may not you know, may not matter. Of course, there have been other studies I know in patients that they did see some IL-1 beta increase. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it it could have been that those, you know, depending on the different populations and and it goes back to what we don't know about uh, this virus is why there's such a differential immune response between people. I mean, IL-6 antibodies to the receptor have been used, and Daniel Griffin says sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It depends when in the course of infection, but it would be interesting. There must be a TNF-alpha trial uh, in in progress, I would guess. Yeah, Yeah, right. Yeah, IL-6 seems to be one of the key cytokines that we keep hearing about, so that's repeatable, and it seems like the Mm -hmm. tocilizumab you know, has been effective. Um, But, you know, what would be the point of this? You know, what what's the point of predicting this? And I I imagine that if you could detect these biomarkers earlier, then you could, you know, I, you wouldn't want to give tocilizumab before you have IL-6, because it also plays a role Mm -hmm. in (laughs) clearance. So, yes, yes. So, so what do you guys, when you think of biomarkers, you know, what do you think the goal is here? Do you think it's to try to catch people earlier and then implement some type of antiviral or immune suppression agent? Um, it's I nice to it, know this, but it's like, well, you know. I think that it could either be something that could be useful to catch people or, earlier, 
or it could be a potential target for therapies. Um, and the the therapy target might be working right now, um, but I think that would be useful longer term to be thinking about um, what we could use to find those patients who are going to um, be really sick early on. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, they guide clinical trials. That's that's one thing. But in terms of if a patient comes in and they have high biomarkers, right, what do you do? Right now, we don't have so many antivirals. So right. maybe you could say, okay, this person is at risk for serious disease. Maybe we put them on remdesivir, which is all we have right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if you wait a few days, then it's really too late for remdesivir to matter. So. I One would wonder, goal. though, if they are already coming into the hospital with high levels of IL-6 and TNF, is it already too late? Too late? I, I, I totally agree. storm already happening? Yeah, I totally agree. I think if you're sick enough to go to the hospital, it's really, <laughs> it's going to be too late for therapeutics almost. I right. mean, there's a marginal effect of remdesivir, but it's really marginal by that right. time. And, and Cindy, with the comment you made before about IL-1, Mm -hmm. um, I think the only studies that I've seen that had that showed elevated IL-1 were looking at transcript mm -hmm. um, and all of the ones that looked at wow. protein um, said no effect of IL-1 and only showed IL-6. Oh, isn't that fascinating? So, mm. you know, so the, 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 the massive amount of information that's being left out here is when you have an inflammatory stimulus, uh, you, you produce the mRNAs, as you say, um, Brianne, mm -hmm. that uh, the proteins are typically made from that, and then those proteins are secreted from the cell, and they have their action. But what's really interesting about IL-1 and IL-18 is another one, and there's a bunch of other cytokines that are similar to this, but those two in particular, they get made but retained in the cell. And so you can make little lots and lots of them, and they're not secreted. You won't detect them in the blood. You won't detect them outside the cell. Because you need this thing called the inflammasome to cleave them and also right. to cleave some other proteins called gas germin D, which I, I'm fascinated with, that pokes little, <laughs> holes, pokes little holes in the membrane and allows the IL-1 to get out. So you need this second step. And, you know, it makes sense because IL-1 is much more inflammatory, much more damaging than IL-6 and TNF typically. And so there's an extra layer of regulation for secretion of the cytokine. So it's really great. But, you know, um, the idea that you're saying that, you know, you see these transcripts up makes sense, but that you don't get this second step and release of the IL-1 until there's some other event which may not be happening. So then the question, becomes as I as I posed before, you know, would it be worthwhile to target that? Well, mm -hmm. you know, if there's no secretion of IL-1, it doesn't make sense to try and target the IL-1 that's secreted. And does it make sense to try and target the inflammasome? Well, maybe. So if the transcript is really high and there might be protein made, there could it, the cells could be chock full of IL-1, but not releasing it. But all it requires is a tiny little trigger and boom, you have this release of IL-1, which could be overwhelming to the body, right? right? So maybe blocking that could block that second step and second release. So, you know, there's still some, you know, value to looking into that, I think. Exactly. And I think the other thing that makes me sort of intrigued with the inflammasome here is that there is some evidence of the inflammasome maybe be inv involved in um, negative regulation of interferon. Mm -hmm. That interferon versus the inflammasome are sort of, you, you can have one or the other. They cross-regulate each other. Mm -hmm. And um, it always strikes me as very odd how little interferon there is yeah. um, in some of these SARS-CoV-2 patients. Yeah, yeah, which we could talk about uh, further, because that is something very consistent that people are finding. The The next little paper uh, kind of point I have is a paper out of Ben Tanuver's lab. And they were what he, they did was they looked at a variety of cell culture models. So they did different respiratory cell lines, they did primary airway bronchial epithelial cells. So that's a pseudostratified layer. It's It's like a 2D model. It's it's trying to represent more of the airway uh, in, in its nuance of different types of cells. And I think they did some animal studies as well. But, you know, consistently they found IL-6 was up, chemokines were up that would recruit neutrophils or macrophages, but interferons were down. Mm -hmm. And what we know about coronaviruses is, so while, yes, they have these 
structural proteins that are encoded and they're, they're holding together the virion. They are the antigenic determinants on the outside of the virion. But inside, uh, there are a lot, six, well, 16, at least from previous coronaviruses, but uh, these non-structural proteins that do very good job of inhibiting interferon uh, in previous coronaviruses like SARS-1, but also um, a, a lot of animal coronaviruses. And so I, I think that is just a function of this virus that you do not see in other respiratory viruses like influenza or RSV. So what's the point of keeping down interferons? Well, we know it's a very good antiviral um, interferon stimulating gene that can um, upregulate inside the cell and help the cell detect the virus um, and prevent replication. And so without that, coronaviruses can replicate, but then you have an increase in IL-6. So I, I, you know, for whatever reason, coronavirus has not found a way to deal with those cytokines. So you still have the influx of cells. But it's possibly that imbalance that's kind of inherent in coronavirus uh, biology that's leading to this, um, what we see in patients. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because I think, you know, without that previous work on coronaviruses, we, we would not know as much. But if we had more information on coronaviruses, like if there was more funding on it, we would probably have more targets for, <laughs> you know. Yes, that would be very helpful. <laughs> Yeah. Do people see a theme here as we bring that up every time? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Between all the TWIV episodes I've done and, and talking with you guys on Immune, it, it, I don't know. Is there some theme about needing to know more things? Basic <laughs> virology. Yeah, I know. A little bit of funding here and there, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brianne, you have been on a podcasting role. Con I mean, Vincent as well, of course, but <laughs> been putting out a lot of them. That's good. I have. Well, you know, right now I don't have any grading. I don't have any students. So it seems like a good do you time. Want to do, do you want to do some of my NIH critiques? For <laughs> um, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, was say, oh, I was like, I, I'm done classes. And then I was like, oh, I agreed to do the study section. Oh, my. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. I'm enjoying it. I love it. There's all kinds of really cool stuff coming. Not, no, no COVID stuff yet, but. Well, that's, really, that's good. That's really probably nice stuff. to be able to look at some non COVID stuff, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so good. Well, that's, you know, that's some of the innate immune stuff that's popped up. I mean, there's, t I'm in, I'm in a space where there is so much stuff coming up that, I mean, I can maybe deep read papers, but really, you know, you're, you're reading the most recent one. That's the big splash. You're trying to dissect it, but there's a lot of stuff coming out. So, you know, in terms of innate immunity, there'll be more, but have you guys seen anything else out there worthy of talking about? I'll talk about this multi-system inf inflammatory syndrome in kids in a bit, but yeah, it seems to be the other hot thing. No, these are the ones that have been on my radar. Yep, um, the most. Cool. So, so right the, the the one thing, one of the things that has come up in, in the pediatric world is a big deal, just because the number, the percent increase in the the amount of kids they're seeing with what they're saying is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome or Kawasaki-like syndrome. Um, it's, it's a disease that, I mean, it was first described in the sixties in Japan and it, they, they didn't have any known etiology, meaning they had no idea why this was, these kids were coming down with basically, um, the coronary arteries, which carry oxygen to the heart, they become inflamed. And when immune cells leave the bloodstream, um, and they can then, you, you basically have leaky blood vessels. And so you see these things like strawberry tongue, their tongues are really red. Um, you see other type of rashes. And this Kawasaki disease, it's it can cause this hyperinflammatory system in multiple organs and kids can die from it. What What's amazing with Kawasaki disease is it seemed that treatment with immunoglobulin. So just um, intravenous bulk immunoglobulin was a treatment and most of the kids would recover, which would make you think that it's an possibly an overreactive antibody response that's binding to the walls of the blood vessel. And if you give kids a whole bunch of nonspecific immunoglobulins, maybe they would block the portions that are binding to the walls of the blood vessels. Um, but you also just give aspirin because you're trying to keep the, the inflammation down. Um, but this, w what people are seeing and what pediatricians are seeing, it's Kawasaki-like because they're, they're not exactly seeing every sign and symptom. It's also coming with um, 
like a sepsis, N- not so much a cytokine storm, but but something similar. And uh, the numbers, especially in New York, so it was Italy that had a report, and then in New York, they had a lot of cases of kids with this unspecified um, inflammatory syndrome. And because they were associated with pe- with people who were positive for COVID, that was the association was was that they were potentially their immune systems were being activated by SARS-CoV-2. What we know about infection in kids is they can, the virus does replicate inside um, cells of, you know, in children, but they they don't have the signs and symptoms that we see in older individuals. And, and it's late onset. So when they see this inflammation, it might be like three or four weeks mm-hmm. after a potential exposure. And so it does, you know, ask the question, if we're seeing RNA for a long time, you know, in patients, is this low level inflammatory syndrome caused by, you know, there has to be some replication cells if you're still seeing RNA that long out. Um, But that's one of the big questions that when you think about kids going back to school, you know, what is their role in transmission? And are you going to see pockets of kids with this kind of um, with, with Kawasaki like syndrome? So I, I think it's played a role in in how people are thinking about going back to school and summer camps. And w- we don't know much about how kids transmit this virus. Well, as Daniel Griffin says, though, this is pretty rare still, even though, you know, the reports are amplified. But overall, among kids, it's a pretty rare syndrome. It is. So so I think be- the reason it's popping up is in places that have had a lot of cases. So yeah. New York... I mentioned Italy, I think Great Britain. But what was interesting, I, you did not see reports coming out of China I, I, about about this. And I would just yeah. would have expected that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't thought about that. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, you would think it would be coming out of Wuhan. They had, you know, as many cases as, you know, the big cities here. So they may, they may not have made the connection yet. That That's point. true. That's true. Yeah. So I think when we look... Uh, I th- uh, models for infection and models of SARS transmission using young, like young infant animals and trying to see how they transmit to other infants or to, if it's like um, if you're using a mother infant pair, something about rhesus macaques or, you know, whatever, whatever animal model you're using, you could use those models to try to see if they can transmit to each other. Great. So, that's kind of innate immune little hot topics for humor, humoral uh, adaptive immunity. There's been a lot that's come out. Bran and Vincent actually did a podcast on some of the B and T cell stuff that's come out. I, you know, you guys can lead these papers because I actually haven't been able to get through them. Um, <laughs> since you just talked about them on TWIV. Yeah. You're welcome to take the lead on that. We did. Um, so the first one that you have here um, is uh, about convergent antibody responses to SARS-2 in convalescent individuals. Um, it's from um, the Nissenzweig lab, um, but has uh, quite a few immunologists um, whose names I uh, am familiar with. Um, and um, some of the things that they do in this study are sort of look at um, a whole bunch of individuals, 149 individuals who had COVID-19, um, collect plasma and look at neutralizing antibodies to try to determine how many had sort of high titers versus uh, lower titers. And they find that relatively few um, had uh, very high titers of neutralizing antibodies. But then when they took those uh, antibodies and actually looked at the um, B cell making the antibodies looked at what type of um, recombination had to happen in that B cell. Um, they found really impressively um, similar um, genetics of those B cells. Um, basically, the same uh, VDJ recombination um, events. Um, including sometimes the same addition of new base pairs happened in uh, most of these patients. Um, And so it was really interesting to see um, these, uh, that the fact that sort of 
this there is this convergent evolution, the same antibody needed to be made in all of these people. Um, when they went back and looked at the patients who had low levels of neutralizing antibodies, they did find those same uh, rare B cells, which indicates that they might that they're present and they might be good targets um, for uh, vaccines um, because they are present. They could be um, potentially uh, expanded through a vaccine. They just have not been in these patients. Low neutralizing antibody titers. I think, you know, people ask me a lot about what, you know, what is going to be a good vaccine? What, what's going to predict? What's going to protect people? But, I, you know, maybe the low titers are good enough, you know, but they'll probably wane over time and you probably have to have boosters to the vaccines. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, but who knows? Maybe the vaccine will be different. Maybe if it's a spike only. So one of the things we talked about with, with John Udell is maybe the virus is doing something to perturb the antibody response. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. maybe a vaccine wouldn't do that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, I got to listen to that. This, <laughs> this whole idea that the neutralizing antibodies are low, and this is of some concern, this is the way I look at it. And I think John looked at it this way. You get infected with the virus, you have some protection. Just because we can't measure it, a correlate doesn't mean yeah. <laughs> it's not That's there. Right, exactly. Yeah, right? Sure. So what nobody does is to measure T cells, right? Right, right. CTLs even to see maybe that correlates with protection. In this paper, they didn't do it. And in the other one, we looked at – they did look at uh, – that's the, um, the the Scripps paper um, on T cell epitopes mm -hmm. right. uh, from Shane Crotty's group and others. Yep. There they did. And you see you have good CD4 and CD8 T cell episodes represented, so maybe that's important. So, uh, this idea that oh, a vaccine is not going to work, I don't know why scientists are saying this without having the whole picture. It's sure. troubling. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, in this in this antibody paper, if people are sort of looking at any of the data, I would say Figure three D, um, which actually shows the mutations that they found in the B cells and shows how many of them made such similar um, responses is really the thing that was striking to me. Mm. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the, the listeners who are not the hardcore immunology aficionados may not realize the importance of that, but it, the, the vast array of different combinations of VDJ, you know, arrangements and extra nucleotides that go into making those the fact that those all those individuals make those same sequences is just astounding. Yeah, that's weird. I mean, that's a lot. That's a high percentage. Yeah. yeah. I think they're going to have to tease that out more. And they're so similar. Yeah, that's weird. It just I mean, cuz we've done we've done immune episodes where we were talking about the similarity mm -hmm. of B cells in between individuals. I mean, it was like less than 1, per, you know, less than 0.001% of uh, all B cells could even have some one antibody that would be that similar. So, has that never been seen before? This sort of similarity. I mean, it's just a lot. It's a high percentage. Yeah, I don't read enough B cell papers to feel confident in saying never. Me neither. Um, <laughs> but this is very striking to me. Yeah. So, if you look at the broadly neutralizing HIV antibodies from patients, mm -hmm. so they're all different from patient to patient. Um, there are, uh, well, yeah, no, is right. Because every HIV variant is going to be different from patient to patient. Right. So there are big differences in the HIV variants. Um, there are a few neutralizing antibody, broadly neutralizing antibodies that are similar from patient to patient, but they have some really unique features. Um, and they are not made in all patients. Whereas you find these sort of same B cells in pretty much all of the individuals in this study just at different frequencies. I guess I'm not, you should answer this. I mean, how many such studies have been done where you take B cells from a bunch of patients and compare them against one virus? I mean, I'm sure there haven't been that many. I right? don't know. Probably. I, I can think of a couple of papers, but not too many. Yeah. Well, that, just, that is the thing. Maybe we're just really looking because gosh, the, you know, we have funding going towards this. We have all these patients. You're right. Maybe we're just looking at things with more, more patience, um, more nuance, so we can pick these things up. We also have uh, higher sensitivity and uh, newer technologies to be able to do these things than we had before. 
And so, you know, if you have a time dependent exposure and you're kind of looking at the, you know, roughly the same time after exposure, because, you know, you're not looking at years later, you're looking at, you know, a reasonable amount of time from the time they became infected and you're really deep sequencing these things. Maybe we ha- we were just detecting things we that have always been there, but we couldn't see mm-hmm. it. Yeah. I can't say. I don't know. Yeah. I And somebody, I, somebody had asked me about T cells uh, the other week and... You know, I think there's such a conversation about antibodies just because they're a bit, they're easier to measure. You know, you mm-hmm. don't have to deal with the cells. You don't have to develop an assay where you're either looking at, okay, if you activate the cells, do they secrete the cytokine? And that's how you know it's specific. Or you develop some complicated MHC uh, protein tetramer, and then you can look at it through flow cytometry. But I think, I mean, to get a B cell response, right, you need a T cell. You need you need CD4 yeah, T cells. So, yep it would be behooven upon <laughs> researchers to be looking at both. And, for, you know, they don't really look at T cells in clinical trials. It's, it seems like it's very antibody heavy. Right. It's harder I, to do. Yeah. I'm sort of, sure. uh, every time I read reports about things like the Moderna vaccines, I'm sort of hoping that there is some T cell data out there that I, we just haven't seen yet because I would be absolutely fascinated by that. Well, and, you know, you think about the antigens that, th- T and B cells C in the systemic, it's probably going to be at least different proportions than the antigens they'll see in the mucosa, which is where all this mm-hmm. is happening. We just can't, we can't get to the lung. Well, yeah, and, and people don't really want <laughs> their lungs biopsied, <laughs> so we can't, could get to it. Um, so yeah, that T cell paper that we talked about with Vincent was, uh, and with uh, Jonathan Udall um, was also really interesting in both the way that they tried to um, find um T cell responses and actually pick out um, res- peptides that might be recognized either by uh, CD4 T cells or CD8 T cells. Mm-hmm. Um, they were able to find CD4 T cells in all of the individuals who they tested um, and CD8 responses, and I believe something like three quarters. Um, and I think that that was. That was all really exciting. The thing that was most exciting to me from that paper was that in a bunch of uninfected individuals, um, they were able to detect T cell responses um, as well. And it might raise some questions about whether or not um, the, that might be involving some cross reactivity with some other coronavirus. Oh, the previous ones. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I mean, we don't know much about that at all. Nope. And the role that that plays. And and if antibodies, if we're not finding cross-reactivity of antibodies against the common cold coronas, you're right, maybe it's T-cells we should be looking at. Yeah, and so they have some some nice um, data on uh, good T-cell responses in unexposed individuals um, because they took samples from before this virus had emerged and were able to detect T-cell responses. Ah, so we just have to infect them and see what happens. <laughs> I thought you were against that. <laughs> I am. I'm just joking. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm, or I'm we need snarky. a good animal model. Maybe. Yeah, that's the problem. No, but no animals are getting serious disease. Oh, I that's know. the problem. Only mild. So I they, mean, they're good. They're good. Like the rhesus is a good model for mild disease, but you're right. We, yeah. need, we need something with severe. Maybe the mice will do it. These ACE2 transgenic mice. Well, Ralph Barrick says that have you seen his model where they change the spike of SARS-CoV-2 mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. amino acids, allow it to bind mouse? Yep. He says they get a little, aged mice get a little more serious disease. Okay. But um, it's not, still not the same, obviously. Right. Yeah. Well, that's interesting about the BNT cell stuff. I mean, I'm looking forward to more, I think, you know. <laughs> By the way, Steph, this paper you put in about. Which one? Uh, IgA and IgM, oh, yeah. uh, IgA and IgG in serious patients, they make they seem to make more um, antibodies when you get more serious disease. Right, and that and that's even even in one of these papers I read that was even true, where males had more serious disease and they had more antibodies, higher amounts of antibodies. So I think, I mean, intuitively, it would make sense if you have greater replication of virus, you would have more stimulation of you know, B cells in the lymph node producing more antibodies. That goes back to kind of... I'm not sure that that's it, though. I'm I'm, I'm not sure higher replication is what triggers the serious disease, right? It's really the response, the immune response. True, right. So I don't know what is 
I mean, it could be. I, I don't know. I'm speculating. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. Right. Have, no, the dose. Right? The dose thing is interesting because I just. It, having done so many animal studies and the dose always mattered for, for mm. their immune responses mm. that I measured. And it would just make sense that if you have more replication, more damage to cells, more damps and pamps being released and greater infiltrates. But it, then again, you were saying on so, uh, one of the podcasts that Christian Drosten found huge levels of infectious titers in the nose of some dude and, yeah. and yeah. he didn't have any symptoms. So it's fascinating. But yes, IgA in that paper, now they just looked at levels. They didn't look at how well did these IgA antibodies neutralize. Yeah. IgA antibodies are found at mucosal services. Right. You can develop, high, um, you know, like highly neutralizing IgA antibodies, but a lo- most IgA responses are more transient and shorter lived than IgG. And it has, I think, to do a lot with h- how many antigens um, that, IgA B cells are presented with at the mucosal services because the, mm-hmm. there's a lot of commensal bacteria, antigens, fungi. Um, but they they showed that IgA could be detected before IgG in nasal secretions. And so what that means, I think we'll, we'll have to, it's a TBD, but mm-hmm. don't shortchange IgA. It's still hanging around, still doing <laughs> oh, interesting We would things. never do that. We would never do that. <laughs> um, yeah. And then the last one I have there, if, we were, if anyone was interested in monoclonal, antibody development. There's a group, a good group out of University of Washington. They found a patient who had been infected with SARS-1 and they were able to find cross-neutralizing antibodies um, to SARS-2. And so those could be potential candidates for treatment of, of, of COVID. And so mm. I thought that was interesting. And then that leads us to, there have been some big vaccine papers that have come out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I get, you know, do you all get asked a lot? Is that kind of the top topic people ask you about if, you know, in terms of COVID is the vaccine? It seems to have died down. Yeah. Most people want to know about what's going to happen now in the summer. Right. Yeah. Right. I get all kinds of emails. Can I, can my 90 year old grandparents come visit their two month old baby oh, uh, from California? You know, that kind yep. of stuff, which I don't know. That's hard because <laughs> it wasn't the case that they should do that a month ago. It's probably still not the case that they should do it now. But but I know life goes on. It's very challenging. But yeah, for the vaccine work, so there had been three big papers or maybe been more or two big papers in a um, but preprint. One of them was in rhesus macaques. One of them was in mice and guinea pigs, and they both were DNA vaccines. Um, so different from the mRNA vaccines, the DNA vaccines, they... I think they're a little more immunogenic. They may last a little bit longer, but they could cause potential adverse immune responses. But they, in these studies, they did see that they are immunogenic. These animals developed neutralizing antibodies. And at least in the case of the rhesus macaques, prevented against reinfection, which rhesus macaques do not have symptoms. So you would just have to base that on reduced viral RNA and Mm -hmm. reduction of lung pathology. Now the lung pathology lasts like a day, (laughs) you know, it's like two days worth of lung pathology, but it was reduced after reinfection of the monkeys that were vaccinated. So I think it's at least in the short term, it's suggesting that you can be protected. And probably these reports where you, people are saying they've been reinfected in the short term um, are just testing errors of sensitivity for PCR and not people getting reinfected. Yeah, that was my take as well. Yeah, It's interesting. Well, according to Emmy DeWitt, they get, she said they do have trouble breathing. Um, the monkeys? So, so, yeah, the monkeys. So it's not no disease, right? There's certainly infiltration in the lung and they have, she said they have trouble breathing. They don't get really sick though. Um, that's for sure, but it's yeah. not zero. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that, hearing some people discuss that some groups have been able to do that and get them to, you know, have maybe difficulty breathing. But I know some other groups, they don't see that. So I guess maybe yeah, depending guess on the it, colony, the monkeys come Yeah, from. they're all mm-hmm. different, right? They're all outbred, I guess. Yeah. Right? Yes, they are. Yeah. The other thing here is that every monkey makes a neutralizing response. So that's totally different from the people, right? Yeah. That's right. why I'm saying that we only have a spike here, Right. And maybe that's something else. One of the other viral proteins is doing something. Sure. And so that goes back to what you're saying before that, you know, maybe 
the virus is trying to really reduce antibodies and a vaccine will be great because it wouldn't do that. Yeah, that's what we were talking about with you, Dell. I think one of the other, you know, there are many other viral proteins and one of them may be uh, causing some issue with um, B cell. Who knows, right? Yep. Yeah, that would be fascinating. I mean, that reminds me of the measles story. I think mm-hmm. yeah. there's somebody yeah, out of too. Harvard, yep. Michael, what's his last name? Minna. Min- Min- is it Minna? Minna? Or Minna? Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce Michael it. Michael Mina. Well, he can yell at us on Twitter or something. <laughs> we mispronounce his name. But his group had shown that measles, um, after you're infected, you have a decrease in B cell responses, memory B, memory B cells. So, mm-hmm. It, suggesting that measles actually does perturb the B cell response uh, in the lymph node, exactly where that happens. I don't think that paper teased it out, but right. We don't know. I, I mean, we mm-hmm. haven't seen that in other coronaviruses, but maybe we just didn't have, I don't know, this many people to look at, you know, mice yeah. and rhesus are not humans. So well, have we looked this deeply um, at some of those immune responses with other coronaviruses? Probably not. Uh, yeah. Hardly anyone's yeah. done it. Right? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's yeah. like you know, like four labs doing that work, so I'm sure they've tried to work as quickly as possible. But you're right, maybe not. Maybe not. This um, DNA vaccine, I don't know. You know, there's no human DNA vaccine license. They've tried. Right. They're not for without trying, but none of them have really gotten anywhere. There's a horse West Nile DNA vaccine. So, uh, but, is, but I'm four not horses. Too- you're saying. Four horses, yeah. Right. And the regulatory, I mean, to get a vaccine in a veterinary animal, I mean, it's just a lot, I think, regulatory-wise, a lot easier, too. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, everything. obviously, everything is being tried, and that's fine. But DNA vaccines, I don't have a lot of confidence in that. Do you, do you I feel like, the, M, if you could put your bet, if you were putting stake in something, would it be the mRNA? No, I don't. I would like something that's at least replicating, yeah. <laughs> reproducing the a vector. I like. I think the adenovirus based vaccines are pretty interesting. Um, I know that uh, in China they're doing an attenuated virus vaccine where they're recoding part mm-hmm. of the genome, right? And that's enough to attenuate it, and that could be interesting. Although that may have the other protein that's <laughs> messing with the antibody response that we were discussing, so maybe that's not so good. But I don't know. I just the fact that you're carrying in the an antigen on a vector, it seems to me that would be a beneficial thing. It's like an adjuvant. Right? Yeah, right, right. Because you write mRNA alone, it might not stimulate the immune response enough. I I mean, I hope it works. Don't get me wrong. But, and, and you know, the press releases, who knows what, I'm getting emails from people saying that Moderna is hiding stuff, you know. So, and on the other hand, I'm told you can't hide stuff because of this, this SEC will go after you. But you know what? I have zero confidence in business at all. Oh they don't do illegal things just to make more money for shareholders. I'm sorry. No, you I have all the, you have all the regulations you want, but we've learned in this country that doesn't matter. People can get around them. And so uh, I don't believe, I don't buy that. I'm sorry. So um, I, I think the mRNA vaccine is quite interesting and for many reasons that we've talked about, but I'm not sure it's going to work. Right. We'll see. Um. So, Great. So we have a whole group of topics that we never got to, but we have talked a lot about these things. I don't know. Do I, anybody want to kind of pick through what I have topics three and four? We have a lot of emails to get through. Is there anything anyone feels very passionate about that they want to discuss? I just want to point out this, um, uh, what is it? A paper just came out in uh, Lancet today. Yeah. Which is I just they got did a, that an alert. Meta analysis one. That's yeah. One, physical right? distancing, face masks, and eye protection to prevent person-to-person transmission. It's a meta analysis, yeah. So take it as you will. But they found that. <laughs> listen, physical distancing of one meter or more. Wow. <laughs> for support for that, and also face masks. Um, so I think everyone should just wear face masks. I don't think we should debate it. Yeah, it's so. What, I'm what's not your wearing thought? one now, of course. <laughs> what's your thought on on this idea of um, droplet versus aerosol? Because I'm starting to see things coming out saying that yeah. this might actually be more aerosol transmission than we were thinking, because so we've all thing. been saying droplet, right? And here's so the these... thing. It turns out that 80 percent of infections are transmitted by 10 percent of the people. Right? Hmm. It's not like. Everybody's transmitting who's infected. Only a fraction of them 
Um, and so those people could be super spreaders where they're making so much virus in the upper tract that it gets into enough gets into the tiniest droplets that travel longer distances, right? So I, I you know, in the beginning they told us it was droplet based. Right. But now we're getting more and more data. And I think that's possible because nothing is, is black and white, right? I mean, the, the the only thing standing between droplet and aerosol is the amount of virus in those tiny droplets, right? If it's too low, they don't transmit. But if you've got a person making a lot of virus, it will transmit. So uh, as Christian Drosten apparently thinks 40% droplet and 40% aerosol and the rest contact. So who knows? I don't know what that's based on. But it seems to me that there is some component of aerosol, which means that distancing is not going to help, right? That's but, that's what my thought was, because when I was looking into things, um, it seems like with the aerosol, you're talking about things lingering in the air for 12 hours versus, you know, if you're six feet away from someone and they, they sneeze into their cloth mask, you're pretty much okay. Those are two very, very different things, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, they are. And this, the, 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 the aerosol base is kind of scary because, you know, if you're going to start reopening things, you know, we started out talking about colleges. You're yeah, going to put a whole yeah. bunch of people in a room who def- generally don't feel sick and could be super spreaders and they're breathing into the air and these droplets are remaining in the air for a long period of time. That seems like a really bad idea. Yeah, and so then you need to start thinking about things like, what is the rate of air refresh in the classroom or what kind of airflow happens in the classroom or how much are you cleaning the classroom between classes? Right. So that, you know, not to go back to talking about that again, but some of the <laughs> things I've, I've heard about what, you know, some universities are planning is they're, they're doing an analysis of the air handling systems of every building. You know, some of the older buildings have, not been mm. upgraded the same you know levels those those of us who work in the the research lab buildings they usually have very high levels of refresh rate and so the classrooms are probably pretty similar to that when they're in the same building but when you have older buildings it may not be the same and so thinking about which classrooms would be safer and which ones would not i think might become very important very quickly yeah and then the cleaning stuff we need to pay more because that's hazard that's hazardous. I mean, if they're going into a room where they're expected to decontaminate, you know, a room full of nasty 20 year old kids, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not and, and stuff, you know, they, I hope they're properly protected. I hope that the university is going to provide them with that. But, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just thinking about also the human component of all that. Yeah. I mean, oh, I yeah. think they've looked into the practicality of it. You know, the original, they were like, well, you know, we'll, we'll let one class end and then we'll decontaminate the whole room and then bring another class in. It's just not practical. <laughs> right. The idea right now is to decontaminate high touch surfaces, right? Yeah. yeah. So door handles and, and things like that. But you no, know, that's, that's the plan. I don't think there is a plan to decontaminate whole classrooms. I don't think it's very practical. So, you know, when we start talking about aerosol, we're really, it's really kind of changes the game. And I'm not sure how many people are considering that when they're developing these plans right now. No, I don't think they are. No. I mean, I think the data are skimpy already. We, we're not sure, right? Right. That's the thing. I mean, we're confident that it's droplet transmitted as a certain fraction is, but what fraction is aerosol? We don't know. But, you know, this idea that 10% of infected people do 80% of the transmission, that's something you could work with yep. because then in a class, there's only going to be maybe one person really transmitting. So right. if you could figure out how to take care of that, that would be that useful. Person? <laughs> Who is that person? That's right. <laughs> no, no, no. What's the marker? Is there some marker? <laughs> oh, just Oh, boy. <laughs> But that's what creates paranoia, right? That's, yeah. that's the disruptor in yeah. our society as everybody walks around going, oh, is it them? Is oh, it, yeah. Are they going to cough on me? I mean, you just go walking on a trail and, and you see just some people cower away whenever they walk next to somebody, even outside. It's it's changing how we interact with each other. It's definitely. I was walking on the street in Manhattan the other day and this young lady was jogging up the street towards me. And she she veered to get out of the way so she would maintain. And then she almost killed herself. She tripped on the corner of a sidewalk and almost fell on oh, her face. No. It's like, you know, just don't worry about six feet. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's worse. You know, the evasion is worse than, than doing it. But right. I understand. It's, it's good in a way that she was mindful of it. 
Hmm. And yeah, this is a real problem, especially if numbers go up again. But, you know, I keep thinking, all right, so in 1968, we didn't do any of this stuff. And there were 100,000 deaths in the U.S., hmm. you know, which we have passed. But that just shows you the seriousness of that pandemic, right? Sure, sure. So um, I think at this point, we have to get back and um, there's going to be transmission and we can't we can't avoid all of it, maybe some of it, but I think that's what we're going to have to do. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I think it's kind of going to be a multifaceted approach where you, you have masks, you try to social distance, but then, I mean, at least where I'm at, you can get tested pretty quickly. So it oh, yeah. shows me that testing has improved, at least in this mm-hmm. area. You can go to your university and get tested, is that it? That's it, yep. Mm-hmm. And, it, and PCR or what is that? Yeah, PCR, right. Have you have you been tested? I've not been tested. Um, mm-hmm. I have not been flagged as having any of the symptoms or having been in contact with someone with with COVID. So, but I had a friend who did, and she was flagged to get tested. She did it in a day. I think they got the results back in two days. Of course, you know, in those two days, I'm trying to think. Yeah, did you go course. to lab? <laughs> like I don't remember, <laughs> but that could be a problem. But so it's it's not going to just be one thing. We're going to have to kind of institute a bunch of things because not everyone, I mean, I, it's it really, people being paranoid is very dependent, I think, on where you're at in the country and just culturally, because in certain places I've been, it's people are, it's a free for all. People do not care. They're not wearing masks. They're not paranoid. It's like, right. Get out of here. <laughs> so it's a diverse country. We always yeah. knew that, right? Yeah. 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 It's part of it the beauty of it. It seems to be it. along political lines, though, and that's not very good. <laughs> y- that's yeah. true. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Mm. Yeah, that's very unfortunate. <laughs> but science, you know, we we learn what we can and hope we try to communicate it, but it's it's challenging when there are impediments to 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 that. Yes, very very true. Yeah. So you know, I guess when thinking about the future and. And when I say the future, I mean, there's obviously short term, medium term and long term future. There's this is not going to be the last coronavirus to cause an epidemic or a pandemic. And and so, you know, the question of a universal vaccine, that's something that we we think about with influenza. That's something um, because there's so many different strains of flu and a lot of money has been put into creating universal vaccine for influenza. And I think that's something that will be targeted for coronavirus as well because it's it's in animals you we can never get rid of it it's not something that's going to go away oh by the way did you hear about the outbreak on a mink farm in the netherlands oh no really yes very interesting i i yeah and minks are related to civets and cats possibly and that seems to be a trend with sars one that that family of animals seems to be infectable so, you know, what? And, and, mm-hmm. oh, I was just going to say, speaking of animals, um, I think that the other thing that's really important for the future is, you know, thinking about how we might study animal reservoirs, um, both in terms of tracking viruses, but also, you know, the more I learn about this, the more excited I get about learning about things like bat immunology. Yep. Um, yeah. And we just did a TWIV that was really fascinating on that. Did you, did TWIV steal our bat guy that Vincent was going to contact for us? I think no. So. <laughs> okay. No, that's the guy in the Colorado. Uh, no, no. no. Okay. Good. No, we wouldn't do that. <laughs> oh, good. I'm just teasing. It would be fine. That, we could find. No, he. We case. talked to, yeah. to Peter Daszak about. Oh, we, um, oh, eco health. About eco health mm. and the work they're doing in looking for bat viruses. Yes. We need to fund him. That's important work. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we just defunded him. I know. <laughs> he talks about it though. Does he? It's really. I was wondering if he would. Gosh, oh, yeah, I have so much Twiv to guy. catch up on. Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't stop. Oh, don't, don't stop. stop. That's a, you know, that's what keeps the podcast spicy. No, I, I won't stop. It's just a lot of people <laughs> say it's too much, but don't listen. I, I don't know. A lot of people love it, and they listen to everyone. And uh, so, obviously, what would I uh, do in tissue culture if you stopped? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean stop? What did you do in the old no. days, Brian? Brian, what did you do in the old days when you didn't listen to podcasts? Uh, I listen to a lot of music or NPR. NPR, okay. Podcasts okay. are much better. They are. In fact, I in my commute, I used to listen to NPR. I got fed up with it. Mm-hmm. And I said, I want to listen to what I want to listen to. And that's when I discovered podcasts. 
Steph, is it okay if we do a couple of emails? I would love that. Yeah, we have, I mean, we have until, we have about a half an hour based on everyone's schedules, so we could definitely work yeah. through some of this. Yeah, I have a, I have office hours at 4.30, so. Okay. Need to be done, although no one will show up probably, so I'm not going to worry too much. <laughs> You're not done yet? Teaching a summer class. Oh, okay. Yeah, because they wanted to do online summer class. Um, so we had just to point out, we had one who from someone who doesn't want to be mentioned who says there's a lot of apparently good uh, non-mammalian immunology research at Duke. Yes, yes, there is. And I, I think when I had referenced the non-mammalian systems, I, I had just thought of, um, you know, I, so, uh, Irene Salinas, because we had recently interviewed her. But yes, yeah, there's sure. tons of good work. So what this person has put is the Rawls Lab, the Perfect Lab, and the Tobin Lab, all doing um, great work in zebrafish models. So those are labs what to check What a name out. to have the Perfect Lab, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a high standard to meet. That is. It uh, really is. Own up to. Can you take Stacy's stuff? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, hi all from a fellow Duramite. Yes, great. <laughs> so, we're neighbors. Uh, autoimmune disorders are often discussed as a risk factor, but what about um, overreactive immune systems? I have a mast cell activation disorder, which leads to mast cell overreacting and causing allergic type reactions frequently. Normally, the silver lining is I rarely get sick. And when I do, it's often a shorter course and milder illness. That's really interesting. Yeah. Normally, the, sil um, the silver lining... Oh, I just said that. Sorry. There are questions around whether or not we would be considered high risk because the most damaging repercussions of SARS-2 seems to be from inflammation caused by the immune system. What role do you see mast cells playing in the current pandemic? And how would you expect those with mast cells that do not function properly to react? Thank you for the wealth of info you've been providing during this time on an era where pandemic is circulating wildly. It's much appreciated. And that's from Stacy. Um, so Cindy has some comments on, on mast cell in terms so yeah ma mast cells are like the neglected <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> cell type of the immune system and those who work on mast cells will, will be offended by that but but i think we usually say you know they they, they do important things that are related to allergy but we ignore for the vast majority of what we talk about and at least what i teach i don't know about you brianne but i don't really talk about them in the context of infection I don't either, no. Right. But they do play a very important role in development of inflammation, and they play a role in infection. <clears throat> and uh, I, my guess is if they are activated during viral infection in the lung, they could be a very strong contributor to pathology. Um, I did find a couple of things I looked up um, with flu. They, they definitely are activated. They can secrete their histamines which are, you know, what we typically think of as the mediator of inflammation, which Stacey, I'm sure, is well, well aware of. Um, but those, those also have effects on blood vessels. They also have effects on other cells. And so they can contribute to the immunopathology even in flu. And so, yeah, they could, it could make it worse. However, Stacey started off by saying she rarely gets sick, right? So if you have overactive mast cells, it's also quite possible that you would eliminate the infection faster and not get to the point of the immunopathology because we don't really understand <clears throat> is is a robust early immune response a good thing or a bad thing? You know, do, you know, because we know the immunopathology is by the immune system, but we don't really know <clears throat> whether an early immune response that eliminates the virus prevents you from getting later pathology or it would contribute to that pathology. So I think the bottom line is, you know, it's the cop out. We don't really know. <laughs> um, but my suggestion would be is if you're pretty resistant to flu, you're probably going to be pretty resistant to this one too. I don't know what everybody else thinks. I would agree with you. Um, the only thing I would say is that given that we've known about this virus for, um, you know, six-ish months, if that, a day, um, I'm not sure that I would call it uh, quite a cop-out yet that we don't know all, all of the answers <laughs> to all of the questions. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, well, I, I, I went on the fence. That's what I mean. I'm like, it could be yeah. great or it could be really bad. Yeah. Can we yeah, study we you, Stacey? Enough. Can we draw your blood? Uh, that would be cool. 
Of course, the, the real way to study would be bronchial alveolar lavage, and I don't think she's, she's not going to be into that. Well, right. and that sounds unpleasant. <laughs> yeah. Cindy, can you take the next one? It's I Olivia. sure can. So Olivia writes, hey guys, my name is Olivia and I just accepted a spot at the uh, Microbiology and Immunology PhD program at CUMC for the fall of 2020. Hopefully we will actually be able to start in the fall and I will get to see the famous wall <laughs> of polio. <laughs> Here's my question regarding SARS-CoV-2 and immunology. Recently, there was a cell pre-proof, and the, the link is there, that came out demonstrating interferon signaling induces expression of ACE2 in upper airway of humans infected with influenza virus. Do you think interferon expression in SARS-CoV-2 infection could be creating a vicious positive feedback loop of infection in the upper airway contributing to the severity of the disease? Is this seen in other infections? I've been listening to both Twiv and Immune for some time now and love what you guys do. Best, Olivia. Okay. Steph, you had ideas on this one, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think the paper by Ben Tenuver, and I, we can post it in here, gives a really nice schematic on the front page, on the, the front cover is, you know, influenza does a really good job at inducing interferons. Coronavirus does a really good job of uh, suppressing interferons. So it's probably not the case that coronavirus is going to work in the same way and create this positive feedback loop. It actually seems the opposite, that interferons are downregulated, but yet it's the IL-6 and these pro-inflammatory cytokines that pr that are the positive feedback to having um, severe disease. So the corona, they're just, yeah, coronaviruses are, are good at using those NSP proteins to downregulate interferon, which is probably, will probably be true in SARS in this um, as well as the previous mm -hmm. coronaviruses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Mark writes, dear immune team, Thank you for your podcasts. I follow all of the microbe.tv podcasts. I live in the Bangkok area and continue to be puzzled why the number of cases as well as the per million population mortality rate are so low. Thailand reported the first case outside of China. The hospital and medical surveillance system here is extensive and advanced. Everyone started wearing masks in March and the government took strong steps to contain the spread. But during December to January, there were millions of Chinese tourists, including a reported 40,000 visitors from Wuhan. I read the Chumikov Voroshilova paper, and it occurred to me that perhaps the widespread lifetime exposure to enteroviruses has conferred some measure of resistance to serious outcomes of COVID-19. Hot and humid weather may play a role as well especially in reducing fomites and droplet viability. But do you see hot weather possibly increasing immunity among the majority of people who are routinely outside? Thank you from Mark. Hmm. Um, so I did a little bit of Googling um, on the Chumikoff for a Shalova paper because I did not remember that off the top of my head. Um, and it looks like um, there is some talk there about some of the trained immunity issues that we talked about before. Um, so whether or not um, enteroviruses um, could lead to um, enterovirus immunity could lead to some protection um, or whether some cross reactivity, perhaps. Um, fortunately, Vincent, I think, knows a fair amount more about enteroviruses um, than I do. So he might have a better idea. Yeah, well, the Chumikov idea is that, yeah, they enterovirus infection can confer some transient protection against respiratory viruses. And his mother in the, in the Soviet Union st studied that years ago. Um, but, you know, it's a correlation. He thinks it's very strong. And it's also correlated with OPV, or polio vaccine. It gives you a transient protection against respiratory viruses. So I just, I just don't know in this case if that's what it is. Who knows, right? You'd have to do a, a controlled clinical study to find out. Uh, I don't know. Maybe testing is part of the issue too. Uh, yes, exactly. If you have a great hospital, if you have a great hospital system, that certainly will reduce the mortality, uh, for sure. But I, I also wonder. Answer. You know, um, it's a. Di it, they have different genetics. They eat different foods. Yeah. Um, they have a a lot of generally lower burden of obesity. So it could be it could be a number of different things. I mean, j just the food in the environment, or even exposure to potentially parasites or other things, which I would think not in Bangkok, but never know. Um, but you don't could, think that uh, increasing temperature helps stimulates immunity in any way, does it? 
Oh, it does. <laughs> How does it, does it do that? Oh, go ahead, Cindy. Oh, I was just going to say, um, yeah, increased uh, um, external body temperature, you know, external temperature can raise the body temperature and that can enhance immunity and for certain things. Yeah, I think our mm. first immune, we yeah. talked about uh, yeah. the effect of cold on monocytes. Mice. Yep, yes. monocytes. Um, uh, so. And, and he, he mentions hot and humid weather. Um, Akiko Iwasaki has some um, data out about humidity um, in the environment, also influencing immune responses. Yep. So there's there's a lot of different variables that uh, we I don't I don't think we know enough to know. You know any anything about that? The other the other thing is is you know that might be when the original outbreak was happening in Wuhan, but there were not enough people infected to those who are traveling. Maybe didn't take it with them. I, there's just so many different variables here that I don't know what we could what we could put our finger on. It seems to me, though, if, if hot, humid weather were beneficial, then you wouldn't see infections in those climates, and we—that's certainly not the case, right? That's right. Very true. So it's not the only. There, there must be multiple neutralizing. You know, yeah. maybe if uh, if hot weather helps a bit, something else makes it worse. You know. Yeah, I was going to say. I think mm. you know, hot weather could help, but what's going to weigh more in that equation is a completely seronegative population. So. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yep. I agree. I would agree. Mm. Uh, Mark, oh, no, not Mark, Ash, Akshay writes, thank you for your highly informative podcasts. I don't have a background in micro or immunology. I'm trying to get up to speed using textbooks and resources, Vincent's virology lectures. I had a question regarding a neutralizing antibody immunoassay as being the, quote, holy grail on one of your podcasts. Did we say that? Oh, boy. Probably. Oh. <laughs> Why is this so hard to achieve? And with respect to SARS-CoV-2, do you think that these researchers from UNC Chapel Hill, UCSD, and Emory uh, point to, i.e. using the uh, receptor binding domain as an antigen that can be used as the basis of such an assay? I don't think it's so hard to make a neutral. Well, neutralizing antibody assay is hard for SARS-CoV-2 because it's a BSL-3 pathogen, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But right. otherwise, neutralizing assays are not hard to do at all. No, just it's just a, they're they're not done as frequently as ant, uh, assays that look for antibodies overall. Um, and ideally, we'd want antibodies that are neutralizing. Um, I think that this assay could be helpful, um, but it does assume that the RBD, the receptor binding domain, is the only part that um, an antibody could bind for neutralization. Um, and that mm -hmm. all antibodies that bind RBD are neutralizing. And I'm not sure those things are true. So I think it could give us some information, but not complete information. Yeah. Right. yeah I think we've mentioned that before, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. But glad you're listening, even though it's great that you don't have a background <laughs> in immunology because then you don't have any biases towards one thing or another and you can just learn with us. <laughs> okay, but that brings us back to Steph. Let's see how far we can get. Yeah, sure. Okay, Rick writes, hello, immune team. My question concerns vaccine development. I'm looking at the draft landscape of COVID-19 candidate vaccines published by the WHO. It's reassuring to see that many of the candidates are being developed will be tested, but it seems as though the vast majority involve using the spike as the immunogen. This looks great on paper, but given the high failure rate of experiments in general and the even higher possibility of failure of clinical trials, do you think that current vaccine efforts are putting too many eggs in the spike protein basket? In my utopian world of cooperative science, academic researchers, and, and pharma and government agencies would work together to cast a wide net in terms of potential immunogens. What do you all think about this? Other than the live attenuated and inactivated vaccine candidates listed in the WHO table, are you aware of other possible polyvalent vaccine candidates that can or should be explored. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Maybe consider doing an episode on vaccinology. We could definitely do that. Yep. Listeners like me would enjoy learning more about the field, especially in the context of SARS. And this reminds me, I need to, I did contact my PhD advisor to come on and talk about vaccine development because um, she's done a lot of work in animals, so veterinary species. And she did say she could come on later and it's been later. So I'll have to ask her about that. <laughs> um, um, so he, uh, what is it? Rick. Yeah. Rick has some great, he says, PS. He says, I love your podcast. I'm a longtime listener. 
Um, you know, Vincent's energetic efforts, which I co-sign, he's really putting out a ton of podcast <laughs> content right now, but I want to read something really great that he this said <laughs> because it, it is, it, it is, and it's quantitative, I think. So I have also enjoyed hearing listener comments on Vin, on Vincent's occasional grumpiness to my ears and his different podcasts. He exhibits quite the range on the grump o meter and it correlates <laughs> roughly with his level of expertise so uh, colon non-existent when he's listed when he is an interested novice and that would be this week in neuroscience very low levels of grumpiness when there is another designated curmudgeon and this would be twim slightly higher when he knows a bit more and there's no other curmudgeon in sight and that would be you could guess it immune (laughs) and highest when he knows quite a lot even in the presence of other curmudgeons and that would be twiff but only when provoked so that would be (laughs) vincent's grumpo meter which i love that i think that makes sense because i have the highest familiarity with virology and when things happen that i don't like i get grumpy basically (laughs) That's great. So I couldn't. Does this imply that I get to be another curmudgeon? Well, it depends, right? Because he's saying when you're on, there's no other curmudgeon in sight, and that's the three of us. So, Mm. well, as far as immunology goes, you guys are the experts, and you one of you should be a curmudgeon, though, right? What is a curmudgeon? (laughs) Just someone who is old and cranky? Oh no! Well, I guess. I don't think it Let's correlates see. with, mm. I don't think it means old, although sometimes. Oh, it says, it says, according to the dictionary, a bad tempered person, especially an old one. Uh-oh. So you guys are all good tempered. None of you we're are all, We're all too young for that. Yeah, maybe we're, <laughs> maybe we just need more years in the field to get beaten but down. Said there's no other curmudgeon in sight on immune. He's absolutely right. Oh, so that's right. why well, occasionally <laughs> we I can, can try. Be to be, I'll, I'll try and be curmudgeon-y. Yeah, I'll try. Occasionally. Um, but, well, if this goes long enough, Cindy, you know, another 10 or 20 years, you really <laughs> It gives Cindy like 10 more, five to 10 more years. <laughs> um, so going back. We won't say how long I've already been. <laughs> um, so going back to the question, he asks about, you know, putting too many eggs in the spike protein basket. Well, I mean, I think people are trying to work quickly and, and, and to do that, you know, having multiple immunogens takes time and testing them takes time. So, because spike is the only glycoprotein on the surface and it drives antigenic determinants of the antibody and it's the neutralizing, um, de- yeah, the neutralizing it, uh, determinant. That's why people choose it. It doesn't mean that other, it, you know, proteins on the very end can not, but I think evidence shows that, you know, like the E protein is not a driver of neutralizing antibodies and that's mm-hmm. what people want to see in clinical trials. Um, I so. think that's so, a very good point, right? Yeah. Because, um, we could be missing missing T cell epitopes and other proteins, yeah. right? Yep, exactly. Yep, yep. And that goes back, I think, to the bias of antibodies because people are just, I mean, I think pharmaceutical companies are nervous to put a lot of money towards T cell correlates of immunity because we just don't know that well about them. And we're really bad at doing making, an, making immune responses with vaccines that <laughs> right. do that. Now, I, right. I will point out that uh, the, the Ebola virus vaccine is just the spike in a VSV vector right. background and it works yeah, right yeah however the dengue vaccine dengvaxia um is you know all yellow fever except for the, the glycoprotein and e i believe prme and that's a problem for yeah. the serotype too so yeah this could be an issue i agree Definitely. that's a really good point so I think that the yeah. other thing that you want to think about though is um it comes back to to how antibodies work and how T cells work, right? So T cell, at least CD8 killer T cells, are good at eliminating infected cells, right? right? And to neutralizing antibodies, the goal is to pre- prevent new cells from being infected. Yes. So if you have a choice, what would you rather do? Keep trying to chase down the infected cells or try to block new cells from being infected. Ideally, the best case scenario is you have both, but if you have to pick one, you're probably going to pick the one that's easier to deliver, easier to make the response to, and the one that's going to block infection. So it gives your body a chance to do its natural killing, but you, you know, you have you block as much of the ability of the virus to get in as possible, and so that would be the neutralizing antibody. I think that's why the, the majority of it goes towards that direction. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, great. Do we have right. time uh, for one more? Do you want? To- yeah, we can do Adams. Uh- Who's, who's next, Cindy? Yeah. Uh, me. Okay. Adam writes, Hel- hello, immuners. 
I'm sure you've seen this preprint dealing with a case study of placental infection in SARS-CoV-2. The fact that exclusively this, oh, syncytiotrophoblast of the placenta jumped out to me. Given that SARS-CoV-2 also forms syncytial layers and that the proteins driving the formation of the syncytiotrophoblasts are derived from viral proteins. IFIT-M seems like a plausible candidate here. I went digging for papers and found that both, quote, replication of infectious SARS-CoV and entry mediated by the SARS-CoV spike protein are restricted by IFIT-M proteins. And, quote, IFIT-M proteins inhibit placental syncytiotrophoblast formation and promote fetal demise. The story here would be that other placental tissues would appropriately upregulate IFIT-M to prevent viral entry in response to immunological signaling, but the syncytiotrophoblast has some mechanism downregulating IFIT-M, preventing it from fighting the infection. Interested to hear what you think, Adam. We need, where's Carolyn Coyne when we need her? I know, I know. (laughs) Um, I had not seen this preprint. I saw it scroll across Twitter. I think (laughs) it was, um, you know, there was questions whether or not there were actual infection going on in these cells or if it was an immune, um, other cells being infected and then immune damage from uh, toxic components from dead cells. But you know, I mean, for sure, IFIT-M does block coronavirus infection in other model systems. So if that is upregulated, it could protect against it, um, infection in, in the, I don't know what he's, other placental tissues, what those other ones are. But yeah, does anyone have any insight on that paper? I, I hadn't got a chance no. to get to it. Not I haven't had a chance it. to look at that paper either. Um, the one thing that did uh, strike me when thinking about this email is that IFIDM also um, seems to uh, have a lot going on in other enveloped virus infections. Um, and so the one piece that I was a little bit uncertain about here is how there would be something unique um, with IFIDM doing this in SARS-CoV-2, but not some of those other infections. Hmm. So this is a single case study, a single person who was pregnant and developed COVID-19 and then was found to have some, you know, viral antigen in the syncytiotrophoblast. And there's some infiltration of cells there. But it's not clear if this is, um, you know, a widespread observation, right? If, if And if this caused any issue at all. Right. right? And I mean, is that just, right, is there antigen in there because there was damage to the cells by the immune response? But there, I mean, is it really replicating in those cells? So... Yeah, there's no there's no assay for infectious viruses. It's RT PCR, right? Which they continue to call virus titer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not virus what titer. Was that we were saying about grumpiness. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. This has got a Kiko on the paper, and she was on the other paper where they had virus titer for PCR. Come on, <laughs> don't do that. Well, we could um I'll have to. You know what, Adam? What we could do is dive deeper into this question about placental infection from my understanding it 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 just isn't commonly seen right now we don't see a lot of um fetal demise in women who are infected with COVID-19 so one case report we'll just have to have to wait and see what else yeah one case report does not a generalization make right yes are there any recommendations right now from the CDC or elsewhere on pregnancy and COVID-19 so it, w- pregnant women are not more susceptible to contracting COVID-19. It's if you were to potentially, um, so they, they they test you, you know, and you go in the hospital and there used to be guidelines about separating the infant from the infected mother, which has been taken away. So the CDC did reverse that because that is such a drastic, I mean, move, yeah. you know, and to really not have the evidence and also to suggest that, infants or children aren't as affected. So I think it would depend on the status of the mother, but right now it, it should be fine. You would just have to wear a mask. And then of course the people working with you would be in like PPE gear. So, and, and you know, There's breast no, milk uh, contains high levels of mm. uh, 
IGA. There's a preprint, mostly IGA, um, that was specific for SARS-2. So there's a lot of protective factors in there as well. There's no evidence of transplacental crossing of virus either, right? No, no. There were some papers that suggested that because they saw in an infant who they thought otherwise would have never seen the virus had IgM. And IgM mm-hmm. does not cross the placenta. And so how did mm-hmm. that infant have SARS-2-specific IgM It in utero, potentially, if if they were infected in utero, then that could happen. But it was like one report, and we haven't seen that replicated. So Yeah, got it. Okay. All right, that's Immune32, microbe.tv slash immune. Questions and comments, immune at microbe.tv. Is, if you like what we do, consider... Supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Cindy Leifer is over at Cornell University on Twitter. Cindy Leifer. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks again. This is fun. Steph Langles at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thank you. And Brianne Barker's at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was really great to join you all. Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month.